So we'll talk about geodesics and waves on a class of some similar space times. Right. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm first class John Williams. My advisor was Professor Kukowski. And the title of my talk is Geodesics and Waves on a Class of Self Similar Space Times. So, an introduction in Einstein's theory of general relativity, gravity can be described by a curved space. Uh, it does allow for the existence of singularities or positions <laughs> where space can have a hole or possibly an edge. Um, our goal is to study these similar singularities uh, with my given metric, which is self-similar, uh, from both a classical and quantum mechanical perspective. Uh, classical singularity would be a location where space would blow up in a particle's world line or its motion through space would end. In the context of quantum mechanics, particles are described by a wave function, so we need a new way to define what a quantum singularity would be. Uh, introduction, a metric is a mathematical object used to measure distances between points. Uh, given a differential manifold with coordinates uh, xa, uh, where a can range over the dimension 0, 1, 2, 3, uh, the infinitesimal distance ds between two points xa and dxa XA plus dxa is defined by ds squared is gad dxa dxb. Uh, here, we're using uh, Einstein's summation convention, where the lower indices A and B and the upper indices are summed over. Uh, the GAB is a symmetric covariant tensor. Uh, it's known as a metric tensor. Uh, here, it takes the form of a four-dimensional matrix. Uh, in Cartesian space, the metric ds squared is given by this. So some motivation for uh, studying this project. We believe our universe on a large scale is isotropic, meaning it looks uniform in all directions, and homogeneous, meaning it's kind of made of the same, mat same matter. Uh, in this project, we want to study a class of self-similar metrics that are they're also conformally static and spherically symmetric. Uh, Self-similar means kind of it looks the same on different scales, kind of in general, not a mathematical definition, but uh, uh, we can show that any self-similar metric can be written in conformally static form. And we wish to extend our study of these metrics because they're not really well known in Einstein's theory. Uh, we define a Lagrangian uh, by uh, dividing through the metric by a parameter u. Uh, and we get GAB x dot A x dot B. Uh, we see the distance between points on the manifold uh, P1 and P2 is given by the integral of one half of Lagrangian by this. From the Lagrangian, we can find uh, using the Euler Lagrange equations GAD6 on our space time. Uh, or Lagrange equation is given by du uh, partial L by dxa dot and minus dl by dxa. Uh, we can set the Lagrangian equal to minus 1, 0, or plus 1 to describe time-like, null, and space-like GD6 respectively. Time-like refers to normal matter, uh, null refers to light-like particles or photons, and space-like refers to non-matter. Uh, geodesics are just the uh, shortest distance between two points on the space time. So in flat space, that would be a straight line. Uh, on a sphere, that would be a great circle. Uh, we can read off the metric connections from the euler Grange equations, the gamma ADCs. Uh, these metric connections describe the effects of parallel transport on our curved space time. Uh, we can also find them directly from the metric tensor given by this formula. And we assume that the metric connections are symmetric, so we can swap the lower two indices and they'll be equal. Uh, it's also known as a torsion-free manifold. From the metric connections, we can find the Riemann curvature tensor given by it's a four-dimensional, four, fourth-rank tensor, R, A, B, C, D, given by that equation. 
and we can show that the number of independent uh, components of the Riemann tensor is given by 1 12th n squared, n squared minus 1. And from there we can define the Ricci tensor by contracting the Riemann tensor with the metric tensor. Uh, again, using Einstein's summation convention, here the indices C and D would be summed over, and A and B are the free indices that would define the Ricci, Ricci tensor. In the same way, we can find, define the Ricci scalar by contracting the Ricci tensor with the metric tensor. This is a Excel sheet that I made uh, showing the independent components of the fourth rank Riemann curvature tensor. Uh, each letter represents an independent component, and along the columns and the rows are the uh, indices A and B and C and D respectively. Uh, we can see it's symmetric about the diagonal and you can count there in four dimensions 20 independent components. Uh, singularities are classically positions where the Ricci scalar is undefined. Uh, geodesic paths are either a complete paths or they would end at uh, classical singularity. Uh, in this project, I focused on scalar curvature singularities, which are the strongest type. So the metric I was studying, uh, given in a paper by Patrick Brady, is this expression. Uh, the metric is self-similar, spherically symmetric, uh, course and corresponds to a conformally static space-time. So I don't know if I mentioned, but Conformally static means there is some transformation that uh, we can get a static space time from so that uh, its evolution doesn't depend on time. Uh, leaving off the factor of e to the 2t out in front gives us the static portion or a portion that would be static. And uh, we want to test different functions for g1 and g2 of x uh, to see what singularities arise in our space time. Yes. Sorry, is it easy to see from the equation that it's self-similar, or is that not so obvious? What do you mean by that? It is self-similar. Um, it's not so obvious. I don't have an exact mathematical description of self-similar, but. So I just like something about on large scales. Right, on large scales and smaller scales, it, it sort of looks similar at different levels. So evaluating the Lagrangian, we get that top expression. And going through, I used a notebook in Mathematica to find the Riemann curvature tensor and the Ricci scalar and the Ricci scalar. Uh, the Ricci scalar is what we're most interested in. And it's given by, in general, this rather long expression. Uh, we choose uh, g1 to be minus 1 and g2 to be x to the n. Um, reason for choosing this is if we look at the Ricci scalar, this term out in front is has a factor of g1 and g2 in the denominator. So if we choose functions that at zero gives us something that would uh, create a singularity, it would, it would blow up and go to infinity. Um, so we chose those two functions and evaluating the Ricci scalar, uh, we get that expression and taking the limit as x approaches 0 gives us uh, this expression, which diverges for all n values greater than 1. Uh, these metrics have a classical singularity of the origin. Uh, we can find radial geodesics on our space time, um, setting a theta dot and phi dot equal to 0, so there are no angular variations. Uh, from the Euler-Lagrange equations, these are the two equations we get. And going through and solving them using a parameter s, we find these two for null particles or photons. So those would be the trajectories that a photon would take through my metric. Uh, for time-like geodesics or massive particles, the uh, process is the same, but the Lagrangian, we added another constraint by setting Lagrangian equal to minus 1. 
uh, this simple, we use a substitution, u equals e to the 2t, solve the t equation, and simplifies down to those expressions, and we find these three cases for the x equation. So uh, quantum mechanical analysis. I'm sorry, yes. Uh, solving the differential equations, they're just uh, constants right. of okay. integration. So uh, quantum mechanical analysis, uh, we use the Klein-Gordon scalar wave equation uh, to study quantum mechanical singularities. Uh, we define a space time to be quantum mechanically non-singular if the spatial part of the operator in the Klein-Gordon equation is essentially self-adjoint, uh, meaning uh, the operator is self-adjoint, or is there's some extension in which it is self-adjoint. Uh, since it's a second-order differential equation, it can have two solutions. Uh, if one of the two solutions is not square integral at the or near the origin, then the spatial operator is defined to be essentially self-adjoint. Yes? What do you mean by spatial? You have a, an X a data of T. What's the spatial for the corporate? Uh, so this uh, operator, it, it's kind of the general relativistic version of the Laplacian. Um, so it just, it's a wave operator. Um, I'm not sure how it's... Well, you distinguish a spatial part. I'm trying to understand which part is the spatial part versus... So Klein, Klein Gordon has the Laplacian and, and 1 over c squared d by dt squared. Right. Are you talking about the spatial part being the... the, part, the uh, in this case, I consider the entire uh, expression on the left-hand side. Not, perhaps the word spatial is just unclear, but I was considering the entire uh, klein coordinate operator. So, so one fourth spatial. What was the spatial? Um, I was using the entire operator. Perhaps the word spatial is incorrect to use. Just mean the operator works inside. Yes. Sorry. Uh, we use criteria given in Reed and Simon's Fourier analysis and self-adjointness uh, to determine whether the operator is self-adjoint. Uh, we can write the Klein-Gordon equation in Schrodinger form: uh, h psi equals e psi, where h is the Hamiltonian operator d dx squared plus some potential and E is the corresponding energy of the wave function. Uh, we say the potential is in the limit circle case at x equals zero if for some and therefore all solutions of the Klein-Gordon equation are square integral at zero. And the opposite case, uh, v, of, v of x is in the limit circle case. If it's not in the limit circle case, then it's in the limit point case. Uh, here are some theorems given by Reed and Simon. Uh, these theorems allow us to determine uh, whether uh, the operator is limit point or limit circle. Uh, and this lower one is uh, one I use specifically. Uh, if potential, it, we, sorry, if the potential uh, compared to three fourths x to the minus two, uh, if it's greater or less than that then it gives us whether the, potent, the operator is in limit point or limit circle case. So be, to begin evaluating the Klein-Gordon equation, uh, we expand out uh, the summation over the A and B dummy indices, uh, and we reduce the equation to that. We assume the solution phi is separable, so it's t of t, x of x, and y as a function of the angles theta and phi. Plugging that in, we get this for our differential equation. Uh, we can separate out the angular portion, and we find uh, the solutions are the spherical harmonics. They're well known, uh, uh, given by e to the im phi and the associated Legendre polynomials. Uh, we find a simple harmonic oscillator in the T equation, 
and the resulting x differential equation is given by this expression. In the conformally static case, um, we add in the e to the 2t term back in front. Uh, and the only difference evaluating the klein gordon equation is we get a damped harmonic oscillator for the t equation. And we find that the x differential equation agrees with the, the static case, these two. Uh, those were for a uh, massless uh, klein gordon so the m squared phi dot was zero in those two cases. Uh, in the massive case, we add in the m squared phi dot on the right-hand side. And we get, again, the spherical harmonics. And uh, this is our x equation that we get. Uh, in the massive conformally static case, these are results. Uh, we find that uh, the t and the x equation in this case are not separable. So we force uh, g1 to be minus 1 in order to uh, have separable solutions. And we're going to use g1 as minus 1 to compare to our classical anyway. So it's made sense to make that uh, substitution. Uh, we get this equation for the x and another damped uh, harmonic oscillator for the t. Uh, those, all those four equations were uh, had some first derivative term, uh, x prime. So we want to use square integrability conditions in order to write it in Schrodinger form uh, to essentially get rid of the x prime term. Uh, to do this, we make a variable substitution of both independent and dependent variables. So we're changing uh, x of x to eventually psi of r modulo some function f of x. Uh, so we force uh, g3 is the three-part determinant of the metric, and g0,0 is the first uh, term in the metric tensor. Uh, going through, we find this relation dr is f squared g, g2 to the 1 half e to the 2x dx and f of x must be e to the minus x. Plugging those two in and simplifying, we get our resulting equation as this expression. We have a psi double prime term plus uh, some potential term times psi and uh, energy. Uh, and we've gotten rid of the first derivative term. Uh, we now can use the theorems from Reed and Simon to compare this potential to uh, what, what was stated in the theorems. Uh, so in the case where g2 is x to the n, uh, we have this expression for the potential. And comparing that to 3 force r to the minus 2, uh, this potential is in the limit circle case for all values of n, and therefore the operator is not essentially self-joint, and we have a quantum singularity. In conclusion, uh, we see that the classical singularity at the origin uh, was shown by the Ricci scalar being zero. And using the Klein-Gordon scalar rate equation, we determined that the singularity cannot be resolved. So classically, the particle would be uh, would fall into the origin into a singularity, and quantum mechanically, a wave would experience that singularity in the same way. Uh, a test quantum wave packet would need to have boundary conditions specified in order to find the time evolution of the wave packet. So. Um, in other words, if we just set an uh, initial wave, uh, we would not know what its evolution would be because there's a singularity at the origin. Uh, future work that uh, could possibly be done with this project, uh, analyze the metric in terms of Maxwell's equations uh, to see again if we have a singularity and try other cases for G1 and G2 in the metric. These are my references, and that's all I have.